And I feel like just staying here and being done. And I could be done, but I'm not that smart. I'm going to move on <laughs> and talk about the ways that this grace changed David's life in the Old Testament before Jesus even came, and how it should transform our lives, who are even in a better place after he has come. And I have split them up for you in the acronym GRACE, right? GRACE usually is used for an acronym to define grace, which is what, everybody? God's grace. riches at Christ's expense. Yeah, it's been a long time. God's riches at Christ's expense. But today, I'm going to show you some characteristics of David's life that stand out for me. And they are these. Graciousness. Read it with me. Reckless trust. Authenticity. And companionship. These four. Wow. I'm going to shoot right through these. I give you a lot of stuff. All the references are there. First, it's graciousness. David knew because he received grace from God how to be gracious toward other people. One person that I particularly think about, there could have been many examples that I could have shown you, was a guy named by the name of Mephibosheth. Everybody say that name with me. Mephibosheth. Say it again. Mephibosheth. Name, never name your kid Mephibosheth. Okay? All right? It doesn't even sound right shortening it. Learning it. Mephi, Mephi. What's that? Right? There's some kind of alcohol or something. I don't know or drug. But anyway, it's Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, I can't even say that, right? Was the, was the grandson of King Saul, the enemy of, God, enemy of David, and the son of Jonathan, David's best friend. Okay? But because Mephibosheth is in the line of King Saul, he, technically speaking, is still David's enemy and a potential danger to David. David calls Mephibosheth in, who is lame in his feet. He can't even walk right. And he comes groveling before David because he's afraid that David is now going to kill him. He is, the, he, is an, he is a family member and possibly even an heir to the throne of David's enemy. But you know what, Mephibosheth, what, what David says to Mephibosheth? My son. And he brings him in, and Mephibosheth says... What am, what am I, a dead, lame dog, that my Lord has such mercy on me? Yet David says, none of that, none of that. I'm going to show faithfulness to you. I'm going to show loving kindness to you. From now on, you will be like a son to me. And Mephibosheth lives inside the palace with David and dines at his table for the rest of his life. Wow. That's graciousness. Let me ask you. What element of God's grace has touched your heart? As I was just talking about it today, have you known His forgiveness? A lifetime of guilt. He took it away in one moment. And when you feel guilty later on, you can go back to that moment and experience His presence again. Have you been forgiven? Have you been moved by forgiveness? Then learn to forgive. Forgive. Let go of hatred. Let go of bitterness. Repent of that. Stop murdering people in your heart and forgive. You have been a murderer, yet God has forgiven you, so forgive others. Has God been gracious to you? Do you live a comfortable life? Has God given you material possessions? If that's the case with you, what, what do you have that you have not been given? What do you have? Well, I did it with my, with my bare hands, with all the, with, with the strength that I just worked out with all these muscles. Uh, who gave you the strength to work out? Who gave you the desire, the will, the discipline? God did. So be generous. Be generous with your time. Be generous with your talents. Be generous with your money. Because your God is generous. He's been generous to you. Here's another, a beautiful aspect of David, and that is authenticity. He knew how to be, well, what I mean, reckless trust. I'm sorry, here I am with reckless trust. Okay, sorry. Reckless trust. David knew how to recklessly trust in God. Here I'm thinking about his time as he was being persecuted by King Saul. And because he was being persecuted and Saul was still king and he was just the leader of a rat pack, about 600 plus men or so, and uh, when he had gone out of his city, his city was called Ziklag. What city was it, everybody? 
Ziklag, right? You can think of Zippo, the, the fire, the Zippo, the, the lighter. Don't ask me how I know about that lighter, okay? But Zippo, the lighter, okay, I'm a bit of a pyro, all right? It's not because my smoking, but all right. Uh, Zippo, okay? Because it's the easy to remember because when they had come back home to Ziklag, the place was on fire. The place was on fire. Enemies had come and raided it, and they had taken away the families of all these men. And these men that David trusted, these men that David trusted with his life were now talking about taking David's life, about stoning him because they were so miserable at David's leadership. And look at David's leadership. You know what he does? He falls on his face, and the Bible says he strengthened himself in the Lord. He's on his face, and this is one of my favorite verses that says this, Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. I want to challenge you, just like Jesus. What does Jesus do? He refuses to trust in his own wisdom. In the Garden of Gethsemane, you know that his words, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus is trusting with reckless abandon. He says, he says, just like the friends of David forsook him, he says to his disciples, those who are closest to him, who walked, slept, and, and has been with him for three years, you know what he says to them? All of you will leave me. All of you will forsake me. But I am not alone. The Father is still with me. Jesus knew how to live in the place of, of reckless trust where nothing else matters but God. And God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And that is enough. I want to challenge you, not so much like David, but like Jesus. Go to the place of reckless trust in God because Jesus is worth that trust. And he it is not reckless in the long run because the one you trust holds your past, present, and future in his loving hand. Trust him. When things that get difficult for you in your schoolwork, trust him. When relationally you have a difficult time with somebody that you love for a long time, you, that, that relationship is broken, you can't see it coming back together again, that's okay. Trust him. I don't know how that's going to turn out, but I do know this. God, your best friend, will never leave you nor forsake you. Trust him. Amen. Go to that place where only Jesus matters. You know that place. You tasted it. Every Christian has. And if you've never tasted it, let this day be the day. But those of you who know, go back to that place of reckless trust in Jesus. Also, David knew how to be authentic. He knew how not to hide anything from God. If you read the Psalms, many of which David wrote, it says stuff like this. God, you are a God who hides himself. There are, uh, there are parts where people are persecuting him. His enemies are persecuting him. His friends are persecuting him. And he, and he expresses his pain completely. The feelings of betrayal, the feelings of hurt, all those things that you and I can relate to. All throughout the Psalms, he is so real. He is authentic. When it comes to Jesus, did Jesus know how to pray like this? Absolutely. When Jesus is on the cross, almost every word that he spoke from the cross is drawn from the Psalms. And his words are so real and so authentic. Oh my goodness, I missed this one. On the point of reckless, reckless trust, Jesus on the cross, he says, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Right? He trusts him. But in the place of authenticity, what does Jesus say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He takes those words on his own lips and he says, My God, my God, why, I feel like you have forsaken me. I feel like you are not here anymore. And I don't sense your presence. He's very real about his hurt and about his pain. I want to tell you, I want to tell you people that God has given us a way to process the hurt and the brokenness and the unfairness of this life. And it's not by calling your friend and gossiping and talking badly about somebody else. It's by falling on your knees and praying in an authentic way. Not going through just emotions or, or, or prepared prayers, but just pouring out your heart to Him. And if you can't really even grasp God, if you have to even pray this way, I can't feel your presence right now. I really, really want to. I know in my mind that you do exist. I know in my head what Jesus, you did for me, but I'm not feeling it right now. And I repent of my feelings. Be that real. Be that authentic. So-and-so mis misunderstood me. And so-and-so just doesn't get it about me. And I feel so bad because I just want to punch his face in right now. I do. I do. God forgive me. 
Be honest. Do you see? An absolute reckless trust and authenticity. Be real with him. It's the stupidest thing in the world to try to hide something from God. Can I get an amen? amen. God knows everything anyway. People are so silly. They try to hide things from everybody. You know, people try to hide things from pastors, like smoking, right? Lifelong habit. Why is smoking so bad? Because it's bad for you? Yeah, it's bad for you. But smoking is bad because of its addictiveness. That's, that's what I would say. Because other things you can argue, well, coffee is bad for you. Well, now they're saying it's good for you. So who knows? Maybe smoking will be good for you one day. They say mar marijuana is. Huh? Okay. I'm sorry for those of you who don't know why. I didn't mean to pollute your innocence. But anyway. It's bad because, because it addicts you. It enslaves you. Because people can't quit. That's the problem. I understand it. Maybe some of you are struggling with it. It's a lifelong habit. It's hard. And so when a pastor walks up to a person who is smoking, what does that person do? Immediately throws it on the ground, steps on it, and covers it with his foot. You know what I mean? Or, you know, somebody who doesn't really want to put it out because cigarettes are expensive these days, they put it behind their back. And then smoke comes out of their head. <laughs> Chuck Swindoll talks about a time where he walked up to one of his church members smoking, and the guy actually put it in his pocket. Lit. And Chuck Swindoll just stood there and watched him. <laughs> See how far this would go. <laughs> and the whole point was, it's all right to be honest with your pastor. And yeah, you can fool me. You can fool your pastor. You can fool your best friend, fool your mom and dad. But you can't fool the Lord. The best thing to do is to be honest with him. Come with absolute authenticity. Also, David knew how to keep companionship. You know, I gave you those lines in your, in your programs. You can fill these out. And, then, and, then, and, then, and the one with the C on grace is companionship. David knew how to make friendships that would last a lifetime. Of course, his relationship with, with Jonathan is legend, his best friend. But right now, the, the, the scene that I'm thinking about, about are three other friends who were willing to risk their lives for him. During a battle, David's hometown, Bethlehem, had been captured. But there was a well inside Jerusalem that David was longing for. And he said this. It was just a whisper wish. Oh, how I wish somebody would bring me a cup of water from that well in Bethlehem. David sees his hometown besieged by his enemies, and he is longing for a cup of water from that well. Three of his friends, the generals, hear this. You know what they do? They break through the enemy wall, go to the well, bring a cup of water or a bucket or a flask. I don't know what it would have been. I, you can imagine one person getting that water while two people are fighting off the enemies, and finally they fight back through the enemies and into the camp and bring the water to David. Wow. And David realizing what has happened. You know what he does? <laughs> you think, right? No. He pours it out on the ground. He pours it on the ground. And you all are thinking what? Huh? Because <laughs> right? if you risked your life to get water for this guy to drink, you would at least expect him to do you the respect of drinking it, right? But the point was this. Is this not the life of the people who went and drank, went and got this water for me. How can I presume to drink it? I'm pouring it out as an offering to God. He took that water and made it an offering to the Lord. In fact, he gave his three men the best compliment he possibly could. How about Jesus? What has he done? He has been so faithful to us but in his case, the tables are turned. It is him. He is the one who breaks through the enemy lines. And he pours out his life, blood, and water for you and me for the glory of God. Isn't Jesus amazing? Isn't Jesus awesome? He pours out, he pours out his precious life, blood. The blood of the only Son of God. He pours it all out for your behalf and mine and for the glory of God. For his love for God the Father and his love for you and me, he pours it out as a drink offering. And God accepts that and he's pleased. And we should be grateful. The Apostle Paul was grateful. You know what he said? 
as he served his people, as his body was being broken and spent, he said, I'm glad if I get to be poured out as a drink offering for you. Do you want to have friendships that will last a lifetime? Do you want to have friendships that are truly deep, the way that God has designed it to be? Then learn to pour out your life. Learn to love like crazy, and also at the same time hold on loosely. Don't be a nag, don't be all needy. But know how to love, know how to give yourself, because your love tank has been filled by Jesus' pouring out of his blood. Do you hear me? So don't resent people for not repaying you for your kindness. Is that what you did it for in the first place? No. Be kind. Be good. Pour out your life as a worship for the Lord. And if they respond, it's a bonus. And they will respond. And you will have relationships that are much, much more than surface level. You know, it was, it was kind of a tragedy that one guy as he was counseling with the pastor, he said this, this is what I miss about being a non-Christian. I miss being at the bar. I miss sharing alcohol with my friends and just kind of pouring our hearts out with one another. There's something that seems to happen for, some of you know, come on, don't pretend, I, I know. Hey, you got some drinking buddies, that's what they call them, right? Drinking buddies. There's some connection that seems to happen when you're drinking together and you get to tell these guys who never talk, all of a sudden they're a happy drunk and they're able to share. We who are filled with the Holy Spirit, drunk with the presence of God, ought we not share our lives on a deeper level? Can I get an amen? Amen. It's hard to live out that way. And there is risk involved. But you can. And you should. True companionship. Finally, earnestness. That fills out our acronym, GRACE. First one was what? Graciousness. Second one was what? Reckless trust. Third one was what? Authenticity. The fourth one was what? Companionship. And third, the fifth one is earnestness. Earnestness means a purposeful direction, a purposeful zeal. That's what David's life was filled with. David at a very young age was called to be king and he had his eyes set on that kingship. He followed the heart of God and he continued in that direction and at the end when everything was dead and done, he finished well. In 1 Kings chapter 2, he says to his, his son Solomon, he said, you know, gird yourself like a man. Prove yourself a man and do this. Do, continue what I have started. And David dies magnificently he finishes well that's what grace does grace allows us to fall on our faces again and again and again and get back up again like little Weston I'm sure as he tries to take steps he's walking now right okay duh, right? it's like it's harder to catch up with them when they're walking but they're gonna fall the kids are gonna fall and well, what are you going to do? How can you? How can you? How, do you spank them for falling? No. Oh, my baby. And you get them back up again. And you wait for two steps instead of one, right? But that's grace, you see. When you fail, when you sin before God, do you think God goes, Oh, God, Aiden, I couldn't believe he did that. I didn't think Aiden would possibly fall that way again. No. God knew it from the beginning to the end. And he is willing and waiting and wanting to see Amy and to see the rest of you continue to walk and run and even fly to the glory of God. He's got that kind of patience. That's what grace does. Jesus finished well. On the cross, what does Jesus say? I'm going to cut to the chase. After Jesus had lived an absolute flawless life, unlike David, unlike us, he never failed. He never, he never fell on his face. He was absolutely perfect. He was flawless. And then he gave his life, his flawless life up in a flawless manner. As he was on the cross, he cries out with a victory cry. What? It is finished. That is right. To tell us die. It is done. Absolutely. Even the tense is perfect. It really is. It's the perfect tense. <laughs> As he cries out, to tell us that I had to throw in a pun somewhere, okay? To tell us die, that Greek word is in the perfect tense, a past event having present effect. 
And that's what Jesus has done. Jesus' past event on the cross has the present effect of being magnificent in our lives. It is finished, he has said. And because Jesus is a good finisher, you finish well. You keep to the fight. Some of you are very discouraged right now. Some of you are very disheartened right now. And maybe you need some time to rest. But after you have rested, get back up again. The righteous person falls down seven times and gets back up again. Why? Because there is grace for your failure. Get up again. Get up. Fight and win. Hebrews chapter 11 and chapter 12 tells us that all of these saints have gone before us and we are at the very that we are running a race and that this race is a marathon and we pass the baton on to the next person to the next person and to the next person Olympics are coming up and so I need to share this kind of an analogy right but what do you do in a marathon folks if you have run the, your part of the marathon and you pass it on what do you do you just stand there no, you go to the sideline, what do you do? You cheer on your friends. You cheer on the runners. You know, I never realized how much the audience has a part in the game. Right? What a whole, that's why the home court advantage is, a home, is an advantage, right? When the guy's trying to do the free throw, and uh, in the background, you got all the, all the yellow shirts and everything like that. You know what I mean, right? The Bible says our walk, our faith, is not easy. It's like a race, but it's a marathon. And those who have gone before are standing on the sidelines cheering you on. Because only as you finish will this way race be fully won. Jesus has won the race. Jesus has gone before you. And those in that company of those cheering you on is a person named David. And David says, look, just as I ran by the grace that was given to me, you, by the grace that's given to you, can run and finish your portion of the race Run, finish, keep to it. And more than this, the Bible says Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He began it, he will complete it, and he stands at the finish line. I've run this race for you, so run. This is your identity. Finish the race. Jesus calls you on. So be a good finisher. And in this way, may your lives be filled filled with and characterized by grace in the fullest sense. Let's pray.